Dialogue at the Wilson Center is a production of the Woodrow Wilson International Center for Scholars. And now here's your host, John Molusky. Hello and welcome to the Wilson Center in Washington, D.C. Each week, Dialogue explores the world of ideas and issues in international affairs, history, and culture. This week, we look back at the lifetimes and legacy of the Iron Lady, Britain's former Prime Minister, Margaret Thatcher. Our guest, Michael Geary, is a European Studies Fellow at the Woodrow Wilson Center. He's also a lecturer and assistant professor at Maastricht University in the Netherlands, where his teaching and research focuses on modern Europe and the European Union. Michael, welcome to Dialogue at the Wilson Center. Thanks, Thanks John. Thanks for having me here. As we were discussing, if not for other breaking news events in the U.S., in Boston and in Texas, uh, the funeral this week for Margaret Thatcher might have been bigger news. Yes, indeed. Uh, yesterday uh, was her funeral service. Uh, there was over, I think, 100,000 people lining the streets of London. Um, it was, yeah, quite a ceremony. It was, um, a, for, it was a formal ceremony. It was, it was not a state ceremony. It was simply a, an almost, a, an state almost ceremony. ceremony. Everything in but, but there was, you know, there's no flyover, which is the only thing that wasn't uh, accorded to her. But again, she didn't want this. Uh, for a state funeral, you have to ask Parliament's permission, uh, and a bill has to be signed, which you know costs a lot of money. Um, but for a ceremonial, a ceremonial funeral, the Queen has to give permission. Um, and again, there was some unease in Buckingham Palace because the Queen kind of felt, you know, as she's moving, you know, closer to these big occasions for herself, I think the idea was, well, does Margaret Thatcher really deserve something as big as this? Um, but nevertheless, it was a, really a pomp and ceremony that the British do very, very well. And what, did, does, does Margaret Thatcher deserve something as big as this? I think she does. I, I think, you know, on balance and looking at it objectively, I think um, the first woman prime minister, uh, and so far the last, uh, Britain's longest serving Prime Minister in 150 years, up until 1990. Uh, Tony Blair almost got there, but didn't quite last as long as her. Um, so I think she does deserve this. And I think as Tony Blair, or as, as David Cameron said during the week, it would have been, uh, the world would have been looking at on, on Britain very surprisingly, had they not given Margaret Thatcher the kind of send off that she deserved. Perhaps the rest of the world viewed it like this, but certainly in Britain where her legacy is somewhat more divisive, and uh, there was a lot of mixed reaction to the idea of spending 10 million pounds on, on her final farewell. So uh, I think on balance, yes, it was appropriate to give her a farewell like this. The reaction, the divisiveness, the, mm. the, the bitter vitriol in some cases was somewhat surprising to me. I mean, a partisan political figure, an ideological figure who had her detractors, a, a, a tough lady. Mm. But still, usually when people die and usually when they've been out of office for a while, history has a way of smoothing those things over for these iconic figures. Were you surprised at all at some of the harsh rhetoric and, and uh, op-eds and other Yeah, it, I think it, you know, for the American audience, I think there was a lot of surprise that, you know, that, that people were commenting on on Thatcher with such negativity. And, you know, of course, we should let uh, sleeping dogs lie and, and have some respect for the dead. But Margaret Thatcher is a very, very different figure. There is very few political leaders uh, around today uh, who command that kind of international attention. You know, Nelson Mandela, Mikhail Gorbachev, Margaret Thatcher, they're in the same league. And Margaret Thatcher's legacy is exceptionally complicated. So when she died last week, particularly in Britain, um, you know, she impacted on so many people's lives. So if you were living in Northern Ireland, for example, um, you would have been, you know, significantly affected by her policies regarding Northern Ireland and security and so on. And if you were living in Wales or Scotland, you would have remembered, uh, you know, the closure of the coal mines, the, the union strikes. So depending on, on, on which cap you wear, really, I think it's not surprising because even since she's left office, um, she's, had, uh, she's been in poor health. And there's been a number of occasions where Twitter has erupted with the news that she has died prematurely. Mm -hmm. And, you know, so th there was this, you know, undercurrent of um, suspicion that once she did die, you know, that there would be this this, this outpouring of both um, grief, I think, as well as, you know, uh, people actually quite satisfac satisfied that she's gone. And so I'm not surprised because from a Euro as a European, as an Irish person, I find that, uh, um, that her, she, uh, she was very much um, a partisan politician. Uh, she was very focused and she's very driven. And she, you know, she broke the mold. And by breaking the mold, she upset a lot of people and a lot of special interests. So um, I'm not surprised that this, the reaction was as it was. At, at least superficially, there were a lot of parallels, both uh, in her political life and the way that her life ended uh, and w with Ronald Reagan. Mm. Uh, it, it, 
but one difference is Reagan, even uh, when he was opposed politically, was liked. He was mm. more personally popular, mm. where in the case of Miss Thatcher, mm. uh, people who didn't like her really didn't like her. The, the Guardian, um, in covering the funeral, wrote this. Uh, I'm going to get your thoughts on mm. this. Future generations will gaze on this archive footage, and they're talking about the actual state, mm. semi-state funeral. Mm. They'll gaze on this footage in the way we look at pictures from the 1965 funeral of Winston Churchill now. They will assume this was an uncomplicated tribute to a woman who had served as little short of a national savior, which is why all but state funeral was controversial, why some opposed granting such a rare once a century honor to the former prime minister, for they knew and feared the power of such a ceremony, how it can transform and elevate a one-time partisan politician into something larger, a figure that towers above politics, apparently uniting a nation. You, you read the skepticism mm. within mm. every word. Mm. Uh, it, it, does this do that? Does this funeral, does the way that it all transpired sort of change the history or rewrite the history or begin to? No, it doesn't. Uh, I think if, the, if the, the funeral, I think, was not, I think the funeral was tried, the, the, the aim was to diffuse a lot of negativity. Mm -hmm. And uh, the Bishop of London's uh, uh, sermon yesterday did, did that. To whose benefit? Diffusing the... the I, I think, I think, um, I, I think more nationally. I mean, you know, Margaret Thatcher still divides opinion. That, that's, for, that's for sure. 23 years after she was unceremoniously uh, kicked out of Downing Street, she still divides opinion, largely because there are those in society who say, well, it was necessary to close the mines, largely because you know, they were, well, they weren't productive, they weren't you know, competitive, and also they were bad for your health. <laughs> I mean, let's face it. Um, and then you have issues like the trade unions. The trade unions dominated British politics for, seven, for decades, especially the 60s and 70s. They brought down a number of governments. Uh, Ted Heath's government, which, of which Margaret Thatcher was a member, collapsed uh, in '74. They lost election, uh, lost the election. So you know, uh, the, the, the funeral serves. I think the aim was to try and elevate the person beyond the politics. You know that there, mm. this is also a personal moment. You know, there's, you know, there are children, there are grandchildren who are grieving. Um, but nevertheless, uh, this was always going to be a monumental event the death of Margaret Thatcher. And how people would react to this, of course, we were never quite sure. But people have reacted along very predictable lines, the same lines that they reacted when she was prime minister. So this is really a continu continuation. Death didn't change their politics. Absolutely not. And it was never going to. The coal miners were never going to say, ah, God bless her, you, oh, know, she, you know, she's, mm -hmm. she's gone now and let's, let, let sleeping dogs lie. For sure not. Um, because they blame her for, for the destruction of their, of their mining communities. This is like the Reagan parallel with the air traffic controllers. And the yeah, and I think network. with Reagan, you see, he was able to, the difference between Reagan and, and Thatcher was, uh, he was anecdotal, she was analytical. And Reagan could entertain an audience with his you know, great stories. Thatcher didn't go in for any of that, and she had really n not much humor. She had wit, which was kind of a political device, but she wasn't, she didn't find it, natural, humor didn't come naturally to her. Mm -hmm. So R Reagan is a different political animal, you know. I mean, he has the stage, you know, has the drama, the, the acting career. Thatcher had none of that. So she, you know, came across then as somebody who was um, quite forceful, quite powerful. Uh, as education secretary in the early 70s, she was known as Thatcher the milk snatcher because she uh, cancelled... Uh, she has a way of uh, accumulating uh, endearing nicknames. Absolutely, absolutely. <laughs> the milk snatcher, absolutely, the iron lady. Yeah. Let me ask you, uh, well, let's go a little bit linearly. You mentioned the miners' strike and some of the other highlights of her three, almost three full terms in office. Almost. Uh, in the first term, the Falklands War. Mm. What were the implications of that for her standing? It seemed to uh, bring a, about a, a more robust British foreign policy. Mm. Um, before 1982, Margaret Thatcher had been, you know, had become the most unpopular British politician. Um, she came to power in 79 uh, after the winter of discontent, that famous line from Richard III, Shakespeare's play, uh, where, you know, you had mountains of rubbish uncollected, you had uh, bodies had, had not been buried because trade unions were on strike. So she came to power faced with these problems. Now, she domestically attempted to tackle these. Uh, true inflation, true monetary policy, and so on. Um, but that also led to a rise in unemployment. Um, so we are about the three million mark by the middle of her first term of unemployment. And, you know, the Argentines then, I mean, all of this, many people would say she was a very lucky politician. 
You know, because that's not a formula for re-election. It's not a formula for re-election, uh, or is it? That's a good question. I think I look at George Bush in 2004, and one of my friends in Ireland said to me in 2001, "You know, this guy is very unpopular. He's going to need a war to win re-election." And then and I was like, yeah, well, you know, whatever. But then, of course, it turns out that, you know, people were very reluctant to change the U.S. president in, 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 uh, during the war in 2004. Margaret Thatcher then embarks on a war, you know, in the middle of nowhere. You know, her husband had to ask her, where, where are these islands? Um, and this then kind of rekindles that British spirit, you know, because British foreign policy had been in decline for quite a long time. Um, so the Falklands War and the iconic imagery of Margaret Thatcher driving a, a tank, um, wearing goggles and a scarf blowing in the air, and it all just looked as if you know she was Britannia, and she was you know f uh, flying in to save Britain from well I don't know what. Is, is there a gender factor here? Did the, the woman first woman prime minister need to prove her her ability to be tough militarily? I think she'd more have had a problem of proving that that she wouldn't be as tough. That she wouldn't be as tough, but more importantly, her biggest challenge was proving that she could be. Uh, succeed as a woman in a man's world within her cabinet. Because mm -hmm. most of her colleagues did not want to go to war. They did not want to send a task force to uh, the Falkland Islands. But she was determined. Even the her American counterparts were saying, can we negotiate this you know, at the table? And even Reagan was not so keen on allowing her to use her, her, her air force to use bases in the US. So, and, but she was quite forceful you know, in, deal in tackling these issues. So the Falklands war and victory uh, with, a, with a minimal loss of life, um, really propelled her, her and, and propelled her ratings, and they went through the roof. And then she wins because in 1979 she wins a relatively small majority of maybe 40 seats in the House of Commons. Um, after this, then she's over 100 seats. After the 83 election, she's you know she's and really improvements in the economy. And small. the improvements are slowly coming. Now the improvements don't really come until the mid 80s, but certainly the Falklands War is a major turning point because you know most polls. Most political commentators had written her off. Mm -hmm. You know, she would not have won re-election, um, despite the fact that Labour had been unceremoniously, unceremoniously kicked out of office in '79 for destroying the economy. It was really a question that you know, well, uh, Thatcher doesn't really know what she's doing, and she's dabbling in these kinds of um, uh, economic policies that no one really knows whether they will will succeed. Most of her cabinet don't want to go down this road. So there's only two or three people in her cabinet who are actually supporting her economic policies. And then, of course, after victory, you know, Margaret Thatcher is hailed as, you know, a, a hero and the Iron Lady image is certainly uh, reinforced. And uh, th then in term two, we have the IRA assassination attempt in 1984. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, talk about that, if you would. Yeah, you know, the IRA, uh, Margaret Thatcher had a very particular f um, uh, focus when it came to terrorism. Um, up until she became prime minister, IRA prisoners were considered political prisoners. Um, she viewed them as terrorists. She didn't make a distinction. So IRA prisoners, political prisoners, are granted particular types of liberties in, in prisons. They can wear their own clothes and they have a bit more freedom than a regular prisoner. Um, when IRA prisoners went on hunger strike in 81. One of those prisoners was Bobby Sands, who was a member of parliament, who had been elected member of parliament in Belfast. He was in prison, he was elected when he was in prison, while he was in prison, and he won, he won a, a seat, went on hunger strike, and they tried to call her bluff. So they were like, well, we're gonna go on hunger strike if you don't grant us political status, prisoner status. And she was like, well, you know, you're, you're terrorists, and I don't deal with terrorists. Bobby Sands and a number of others died in prison. Uh, and that then created a new generation of IRA followers and sympathizers. M you know, so that wasn't her, her, her wisest political strategy. Then in 81, the IRA decided they were going to kill her. And it was 1981 that they decided to really do something about this. So uh, between 81 and 84, they planned her assassination. And they planted a bomb in the Brighton Hotel. Um, you know, the timing is really interesting here. Dennis Thatcher was in the bathroom brushing his teeth maybe early hours in the morning of the conference, two or three o'clock in the morning in 84. Uh, he comes out of the bedroom, out of the bathroom. Margaret Thatcher's on the bed working on her, her speech as she would do. Uh, she famously only needed four hours sleep a night. So she would stay up late going over her, her boxes uh, with official papers, preparing her speech, going over different drafts. And Dennis Thatcher had just come out of the bathroom when the bomb went off. Now the whole British cabinet was in, in the, the hotel. In the hotel. Um, if, you f if you rewind a number of years earlier, the year she became prime minister, 
uh, the IRA had killed Louis Mountbatten, who was the Queen's cousin, but the last viceroy of India, he took India to independence. So a, an iconic figure in Indian, in, in Indian history, but he was uh, sailing, fishing in, Nor in, in the Republic of Ireland when an IRA bomb exploded in his boat and killed him. So they killed the Queen's cousin, Prince Charles's godfather, the same year she becomes Prime Minister. Uh, her Northern Ireland spokesperson, Airy Nev, was coming out of, out of the House of Commons when his car exploded all within the same year of her becoming Prime Minister. So her attitude towards the IRA had become very, very rigid, even before she entered Downing Street. So, you know, for any human being to put that aside and look at the Northern Ireland problem in isolation um, is very, very difficult. I mean, she is uh, a unionist, first and foremost. Uh, and when you go around killing members of the royal family, of course, she's not going to take a sympathetic view. And, and nor did they, uh, the, the IRA, when uh, when members of their group had, had died of starvation. So there was, you know, a tit for tat, but certainly it was a very, very traumatic relationship with Northern Ireland. In, in term three, we have uh, a lot of aggressive moves on domestic policy, mm. health and taxation mm. and uh, education. Mm. But we also have the end of the Soviet Union. And uh, mm. you mentioned Gorbachev and um, uh, Margaret Thatcher, Ronald Reagan. We could also add Pope John Paul into that mix of uh, iconic figures from that mm. era. I want to ask you about uh, her role as a cold warrior. Mm. And uh, there's the book, the, the President, the Pope, the Prime Minister, that talks about the fall of the Soviet Union, crediting John O'Sullivan, uh, John mm. O'Sullivan, um, crediting those three with a mm. major role in mm. bringing the end of the, of the Soviet Union. Mm. If you, and, and she invites Gorbachev to, uh, to London. And mm. then it was the Soviets who nicknamed her the Iron Lady, correct? For her it harsh was. rhetoric to Yes. Him. In the 1970s, 76, long before she became prime minister, uh, and long before anyone w considered her prime ministerial material, she made a, a very, you know, uh, harsh speech in London in 76, you know, criticizing the Soviet Union. And it was the editor of the Red Star newspaper in Moscow who actually labeled her the Iron Lady. Which she loved, I understand. With relish, absolutely. Yeah. And she played on this, you know, for years to come. Um, and not only did she enjoy this, but the, the, the Soviet satellite countries enjoy, enjoyed this. I mean, I, I spent six months uh, in Poland last year, and people talk about Margaret Thatcher fondly. She went on a state visit to Romania in the 80s, and two million people lined the streets from uh, the airport to the capital just to see this Iron Lady. But when she, even when she went to Russia, she donned the, the attire of a Tsarina. You know, so you know, she, she really did play to the media's perception of her. But on the role of, of Margaret Thatcher in the Cold War, and I think this is something that has not been probably uh, examined enough. Ronald Reagan takes a lot of credit for this, you know, his famous speeches, tear down this wall and so on. And here in the Reagan building in DC, we have a piece of the, the Berlin Wall uh, standing, which is, which is great. But she, again, where, where Reagan was, you know, uh, uh, liked anecdotes and she was analytical, um, she would have read her briefs from her counterintelligence people. Ronald Reagan, you know, wasn't so good at his homework. So on, on numerous occasions, uh, Thatcher was getting information from a number of um, scientists who had gone rogue in, in Russia, had left Russia and, and had, given her, had given her people information on what the Russians were doing with biological weapons. Now this is, you know, hugely important information. So she's filtering this to Ronald Reagan and saying to him, you know, listen, you know, you need to take a, a closer look at what the Russians are doing here. This is not simply just expanding their influence. They're also going down the road of biological weapons. And Reagan wasn't really, you know, aware of all of this. Uh, again, it was new information she had received. But of, of all of the European leaders in the 80s, you know, Helmut Kohl in Germany, François Mitterrand in France, uh, Thatcher, it was really only Thatcher who was pushing you know, because her economic policies were linked to freedom in general. It was, you know, limited state intervention. So the idea of the Soviet Union having a huge role to play in all of these satellite countries was, of course, you know, uh, she was disgusted at this. So all of her speeches on the foreign policy side were really pushing for the Soviet Union to open up their, their markets, open up to democracy and the rule of law. Um, so Thatcher really was, as The Economist argued this week, a freedom fighter. And if her legacy is nothing else other than pushing the Soviets into doing something and, and pushing Gorbachev in the direction of, of openness and of reform, that's in itself a major achievement. Um, because all of the other European leaders were not as obsessed. For them, the Cold War was a reality. Mm -hmm. It had become part of life. They just accepted it. It was an accepted status quo. And this is why it was so shocking when it fell apart. Nobody expected it to fall apart uh, in the late, late 80s, early 90s. So, um, so she plays a very 
instrumental role in that whole process. I want to get a, a, perhaps a final thought. We'll mm. see how we are on time, but uh, about her place in history. And again, I want to read you something that's in the Guardian's coverage of her funeral. When they talk about a disappointing uh, turnout from abroad, mm. they said good in numbers, low in fame. But then this was about British politics rather than international diplomacy. From America, Henry Kissinger, Newt Gingrich, Dick Cheney, but neither Bushes, uh, neither of the Bushes were there, nor Clinton, nor Carter. She was perhaps more world famous in Britain than she was in the rest of the world, is what mm. they conclude. W what about her place in history? And yeah, it's interesting because when she was prime minister, she was always far more popular outside of Britain than she was inside of Britain. Um, uh, her percentage of the vote continued to decline during the 80s, uh, e even though she won re-election three times. Um, but nevertheless, abroad, she was seen as you know this, this, this hugely important stateswoman, the only important stateswoman, perhaps after Adira Gandhi. Um, but even surpassing her at, at times. Um, yeah, I think her legacy, I think her legacy, once the archives open, and we're at a stage now where we only have access to archive material um, up until the early 1980s because of the 30 year rule on access. Um, so, you know, there's an awful lot more that needs to be explored about the Thatcher legacy from the late 80s towards, excuse me, the end of the Cold War period. Um, uh, so I think certainly, you know, once those archives become open on this side of the Atlantic and, and also um, uh, in Europe, you will see that she has played more of a role than people actually have have, uh, have assumed up until now. The fact that these people have not gone to her funeral, I mean, yes, I mean, you know, maybe Hillary Clinton did not want to be associated with an iron lady as she's trying to mellow her image in <laughs> advance of 2016, perhaps. Uh, and I know George Bush Sr. is quite, uh, you know, he's just been- His health is he, Exactly, so, you know, and Mikhail Gorbachev's health is, 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 is in poor state, and Nancy Reagan, again, uh, said she wasn't mm. capable of traveling transatlantic. So, you know, you, you know, it's been 23 years, so uh, a lot of, and even, even her own her own cabinets were wobbling into St. Paul's Cathedral. So, you know, we, we need to admit, accept that there is passage of time. Uh, Don't read too much into it. Well, I would not, <laughs> no, absolutely not. No. Well, well, thank you very much for sharing these uh, terrific insights into Margaret Thatcher. Uh, a quick, th did you see the movie, The Iron Lady? I saw the movie. I did not, uh, just with the two seconds. Yeah. Did it capture her or not? No, it didn't. It was very disappointing, unfortunately. Yeah. Maybe I'll watch it. Anyway. Yeah, yeah. Michael, thank you for joining Pleasure. us. Pleasure. Uh, in addition to thanking Michael, I want to tell you that after the break, Latin American program director Cynthia Arnson will provide context on the surprisingly close Venezuelan presidential election right after this. The Wilson Center is America's living memorial to its 28th president, connecting the world of policymaking to practical options derived from the world's finest ideas, research, analysis, and honest nonpartisan conversation. Visit us on the web at wilsoncenter.org. And now we return to more dialogue at the Wilson Center. Welcome back. By the time this broadcast airs, the dispute over the close presidential election in Venezuela may be resolved. Even so, the tight race to replace Hugo Chavez raises many questions about the future of the movement he led. In this week's Context segment, Cindy Arnson reacts to the elections and provides thoughts on the Chavismo movement post-Chavez. Let's take a look. How surprising are the results? Did anyone see this coming? The polls that were taken just a few days before the election um, was held showed that there was a, a more and more nar narrow margin between the, the government candidate and the opposition candidate. But that, uh, but there was really nothing in, in the polls that were taken before the election that showed that it would be quite this tight or, or that the gap would be as narrow as it was. Why has the opposition decided to challenge the results and ask for a recount? Well, the opposition is, is alleging that there were lots of ir irregularities, you know, in hundreds and hundreds of them, and therefore is demanding a recount. And there is that ability in Venezuela to have a recount because you can match the, the data and the results that come in through the electronic voting with the paper ballots that are also, um, that are also issued at the time. Um, and whether or not that's going to change, you know, the bottom line is really anybody's guess. But it will, I think, if the opposition is not satisfied and the followers who voted massively for Capriles are not satisfied that there was due dil diligence and a response, an adequate response to the complaints, it's going to be very, very difficult for Maduro to govern. It's going to be difficult under any circumstances. But if there are ongoing challenges to the legitimacy of the election, that's going to be very complicated. Are there any recent or historical precedents that might indicate how this could play out? 
There's really nothing in Venezuela that would suggest that an election, certainly not in the years that Hugo Chavez was president. I mean, the, the, the closest that any opposition candidate came to um, reaching, you know, or, or cutting into his margins um, was last October, and there was still an 11-point spread. So the drop between October of 2012, when the presidential election was held, and these new elections following Chavez's death in, in March of 2013 is, is phenomenal. And, you know, really shows that the country is, is sharp sharply polarized, um, is split almost 50-50 between two very, very different visions of what the country can be and should be, and it's going to make it very, very difficult to govern in those circumstances. What have we learned about the popularity of Chavismo minus Hugo Chavez? Well, I think what's quite remarkable about the election's results is that everybody was predicting that Hugo Chavez's coattails would be extraordinarily long and would sweep Nicolás Maduro into, into office. And, you know, if, if his victory is ratified and it shows that, um, that he did win the election, it's by the narrowest majority of any time, you know, in the, in the Chavista years since, uh, since uh, Hugo Chavez was first elected in 1998. Um, and I think that, that that shows that people did not consider Maduro to be anything close to what Hugo Chavez was, either in terms of his persona or his, uh, his ability to, to govern the country. He had one, one theme in the campaign, which is that I am the son of Hugo Chavez, and I think that only goes so far when the country is, sh is so deeply immersed in, in problems on the economic side, on, um, on, on the crime and violence um, dimension, um, and with the declining um, pr productivity in the oil sector, which is, of course, the, what has permitted the, the, the lavish social spending um, over these, uh, these last 14 years. New editions of Context can be found each week at wilsoncenter.org, and previous episodes are available at wilsoncenter.org slash context. That's all for this edition of Dialogue at the Wilson Center. Until next week, I'm John Molesky. Thanks for joining us. We'd like to hear from you. Please send your questions or comments to dialogue at wilsoncenter.org. You can also follow us on Facebook. Search Dialogue Television and Radio. Our host's Twitter feed is twitter.com backslash John Molusky. Dialogue is a co-production of the Woodrow Wilson International Center for Scholars and MHZ Networks. Dialogue is available via broadcast, cable, satellite, and telco on MHZ Worldview throughout the United States. To see how to watch where you live, visit www.mhznetworks.org. The Dialogue continues on Facebook. Join us by visiting our page, search Dialogue at the Wilson Center. You can also connect with us via Twitter by following at John Molesky. Finally, check out all the latest videos from the Wilson Center on YouTube at Woodrow Wilson Center.